a statewide organization uh, this evening for the third and final session of Q's on the Hill 2022. Uh, I'm Andrea Young, the state counselor for the Florida statewide organization of the Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, and I am honored uh, to open this meeting. I know everyone is excited as I am to hear from our esteemed panel, so let's get started. We will have prayer this evening by our state chaplain, Brother Kim Yarber. Let us bow. <clears throat> Turn to God, our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for being better to us than we have been to ourselves. Thank you this week for what our eyes have seen and for what our ears have heard. We ask that we will continue to get enlightenment tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We will now have a uh, formal greeting by our first vice uh, state representative, Brother Royal King. Thank you, Brother Young and uh, the, the brothers uh, who are joining us today and, and members of our community uh, in the great state of Florida. Uh, welcome to uh, the third and final day of our Cues on the Hill virtual uh, symposium uh, led by uh, a great brother, uh, Brother Russell Drake. Uh, on behalf of our state representative, Brother Darren Tostin, uh, I welcome you tonight. Uh, thank uh, the brothers of our esteemed uh, fraternity who are serving on this panel. Uh, who are going to lead this awesome conversation for us. Uh, and thank you to our state representative, uh, Brother Toaster, who will, you'll be able to hear from a little later, um, for having the vision to bring this back uh, and getting us back rolling in this capacity. Uh, super excited. We welcome you all. And hopefully you all take something from this event that'll be able to improve your, your local communities, but also your individual selves. Thank you, Brother Young. Thank you, Brother King. Is our 7th District representative, Reginald Harris on the call. I can't see the attendees. I'm sorry, Brother Young. I, di I didn't hear who you asked for. I said, is Brother Reginald Harris on the call? Uh, one second. I did not see Brother Harris at this time. Okay, well then we will proceed. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a farce to even suggest that I'm introducing uh, this, this good brother, but I present to you tonight uh, our moderator, Brother Russell Drake, uh, just as Brother King said, great job in executing uh, Brother Tosin's vision and bringing this back and, and bringing it back in a really tremendous way uh, with a three night uh, seminar uh, covering a range of topics. Uh, looking forward to tonight uh, to, to, to cap it all off. I present to you all, Brother Russell Drake. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, State Council Young. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, as always. Uh, State Representative Tolston, First Vice State Representative Royal King. Um, I will now uh, turn it over to the boss list of Omicron Epsilon Chapter at Bethune Cookman University, Brother Mario Bembry Jr. Brother Bembry is a psychology major and a biology minor. Um, he's an Atlanta, Georgia native, and he just crossed this year, number five from 2022, Omicron Epsilon chapter, Mighty OE. Would you please introduce our panelists, brother? Thank you, sir. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, again, like you stated, I'm Mario Bimber Jr. And I'll be, I'll be reading the panelists for today. So we're gonna start out with uh, brother Darren Tolson, the Florida Statewide Organization State Representative was born and raised in Miami, Florida, where he attended Miami Carroll City High School. Brother Tosin found a love for music through playing the trombone in the high school marching, symphonic, and jazz bands, eventually leading him to Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, FAMU, where he became a member of the world-renowned FAMU Marching 100. While music drew him to FAMU, his passion for technology will find him in the Computer Information Systems Program, where he earned a bachelor's degree. Brother Tosin went on to attain a master's degree in management information systems from Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida, while working as an intern in the IT department of the Miami Dolphins. Currently a data processing manager at the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice, headquarters in Tallahassee, Brother Tosin manages a team of developing working on very a, a team of developers working on various juvenile justice enterprise systems. Paternally, Brother Tosin has served as boss list, vice boss list, assistant care and chat reporter at the local level. At the state and district level, he has previously served as a seven district director of the public relations 
Florida Statewide Organization Webmaster, Region Representative, and Five State Representative. He joined Omega Psi Phi Fraternity through the Chi Omega Chapter in Tallahassee, Florida in 2002 and remains active, leading the Florida Statewide Organization as the 24th duly elected state representative. So that is Brother Darren Tosin with a, with a great bio right there. Even though, it, you know, we know about the FAMU and uh, Bethune-Cookman uh, rivalry, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Attorney Sean Shaw. So Sean Shaw is a proven fighter for the people of Florida. He made history in 2018 as the Florida Democratic Party's first African-American nominee for Attorney General. In his historic campaign, Sean fought fearlessly for bold policies that put Floridians first. Now, as an attorney and civic leader, he's continuing to stand up for working people. Earlier in his career, Sean was an independent watchdog for the public as the state's insurance consumer advocate. Elected to the state legislator in 2016, Sean continued to fight for consumers and champion equal rights and equal opportunity for all. Today, Sean continues advocating for working people and is respected nationwide as a leader in the fight for economic and social justice. In 2019, he founded People Over Profits, a nonprofit standing against corporate influence and fighting for rights of everyday people. Sean is a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Florida's Law School. He is, intern he is an attorney at the law firm Vanguard Attorneys. He joined Omega Psi Phi Fraternity through Delta Upsilon Chapter at Princeton University in 1999, and he is currently active with Pi Iota Chapter in Tampa. <laughs> And we have Brother Vice Chairman uh, Oliver Gilbert III. Oliver Gilbert III, Vice Chairman Oliver Gilbert III is a progressive and visionary leader who believes there is no singular path to success. Born and raised in Miami Gardens, Florida, he remains committed to pouring into the community that he helped groom him into the public figure he is today. Oliver Gilbert is a proud graduate of Florida A&M University where he earned his Bachelor's of Arts in criminal justice, he earned a Juris Doctorate with honors from the University of Miami School of Law. With 20 years of legal experience, Attorney Gilbert worked extensively as a public policymaker in areas of education, criminal justice, and urban and economic development. He is also an adjunct professor at Miami Dade College. In 2012, Oliver Gilbert was elected mayor of his hometown, Miami Gardens. During his tenure, he was the driving force behind the exponential growth and development of new businesses leading to additional job opportunities for residents through Mayor Gilbert efforts. Miami Gardens was awarded All-America City in 2020. In fall 2020, Mayor Gilbert was elected as Miami-Dade County Commissioner District 1. Commissioner Gilbert was selected by peers as Chair of Miami-Dade County Transportation Planning Organization, TPO, and Chair of the Southeast Florida Transportation Council, which is SEFTC. Two initiatives he is dedicated to advancing. He joined Omega Psi Phi Fraternity through Sigma Alpha Chapter in Miami, Florida in 2005 and remains an active member. Give me one second. Okay, now we have brother attorney Kendall T. Moore. Kendall T. Moore is a native of Brevard, Brevard County, Florida. He was educated in the Brevard County school system and continued his education at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where he received a bachelor's degree in urban studies and at the University of Florida, where he received a law degree. Mr. Moore is a principal of Space Coast Strategy Incorporated, a governmental relations and political consulting firm. The firm handles local government matters across Central Florida and represents clients before the legislative and executive branches. He's also currently the managing partner of the Moore Law Group, PLLC, focusing in the areas of government law, business law, and civil litigation. Attorney Moore previously served on the Rockledge City Council for two terms and served as the council's chairman and city's vice mayor. Kendall Moore is happily married to Dr. Kelly Moore, and they have two wonderful children. He joined Omega Psi Phi Fraternity through side chapter at Morehouse College in 1991. He is currently active with Gamma New Chapter in Brevard County. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, Brother Vice Mayor Joshua Simmons. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Joshua Simmons is a trailblazing community advocate and an instrumental voice for the Black community in Coral Springs, Florida. Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, Simmons graduated from Florida Atlantic University with a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in psychology. He initially worked in the mental health field and as an educator and currently works in the private sector as an account manager 
at a communications company. Pursuing his own path in politics, Joshua Simmons was elected as Coral Springs Commissioner seat four in November of 2018, making history as the first African-American to be elected since the, city's, since the city's 1963 incorporation. Commissioner Commissioner Simmons was appointed as vice mayor of Coral Springs in December 2020 with the goal to ensure Coral Springs remains a great community for people of all backgrounds. He has led initiatives like Conversations with the Commissioner, a video series focused on open discussions about race, equality, and, and, police, and police practices. He joined Omega Sapphire Fraternity through Sigma Delta Delta Chapter at Florida Atlantic University in 2008. He is currently active with Lambda Alpha Alpha Chapter in Delray Beach, Florida. That is our great, 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 great uh, panelist. Can, can we give Br Brother Brimbry uh, a round of applause for reading all of that without taking a sip of water. <laughs> Definitely kudos, my brother. Very good. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Bossless Bimbry. Uh, thank you for being a part of the process. And we want you to know we always bring our um, undergraduates and younger brethren to the table. Um, awesome. So uh, the protocol already being established. Uh, we have our distinguished panelists on. Uh, I think we can go right into the questions. And uh, so this first question will be uh, directed at you, Vice Mayor Simmons. Uh, Vice Mayor Simmons, can you tell us um, of any uh, legislation passed during session that has economic impacts on your respective area that so you represent? Say, you represent? Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I'll say first, thank you for uh, inviting me and inviting uh, this esteemed panel to, to present our knowledge and what we've learned and what we've seen and what we experienced in this process so that um, you know all of us can understand what's going on and we can lift and rise together, right? And fighting back against some of the things that are happening that just come out quite frankly, not for people that look like us. Uh, so uh, it's easier to focus on what didn't happen uh, during this legislative session than to say what, ha what happened, at least in terms of economic legislation that affects um, our communities and we still have stagnant wages here in Florida, right? Um, you know, they continue to do, you know, Governor DeSantis continue to pass small bonuses for teachers, but still keeping us in the middle of the pack, which is a shame because here in Florida, we are the third largest state in the union. We love the to town, how strong and beautiful we are, and, but we aren't paying our people to live here. Uh, the affordable housing crisis was not addressed. Uh, insurance premiums are skyrocketing. People are getting dropped from their insurance, um, you know, you know, left and right because of how expensive, um, you know, insurance is. Um, education, it's being attacked in the wrong direction. Uh, we're not actually restructuring our educational system so that our kids can thrive and survive. We're not actually implementing enough programs to make sure we get our literacy, literacy rates up. Um, again, like I said, it's easier to focus on what wasn't um, addressed. And when the reason why I'm, I'm hitting some of these things and they may appear to be social issues in nature, uh, all of this has an economic impact, right? Because when we talk about education, we're talking about what our children are going to be able to, you know, get into and, and get as their industry, as they, you know, grow up, you know, grow up um, out of the school system. When we talk about the fact that wages are stagnant, well, that's pure, you know, people aren't having enough money to put back into the economy. People are spending over a third of their income on housing. That's not, you, you, we're not built, we are, yes, we're humans and we want to work, but we're not built to just work and, and you know, live to work. <laughs> we we got to live too. Uh, and so none of that was addressed, what we saw in this legislative session, um, because we have a governor that has presidential ambitions, uh, focus on, um, you know, issues that translate outside of Florida, uh, but they, they, they work well throughout the rest, rest of the country for its future ambitions. Um, and they're even having a special session coming up and still and people of all parties are asking for something to be done about insurance premiums and that would not be a part of this special special session. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't, you know, I guess it's not a, I can't say that there is anything bad that happened economically uh, that impacted our community, but just the fact that nothing was actually done to advance economic progress uh, in our state. Uh, and that's that's a, a real a real shame. Mm. Uh, thank you for that insight, uh, Vice Mayor Simmons. And um, 
you know, it's interesting hearing that from you here. You are elected official. And um, I think we're sensing some uh, frustration even from you. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, caveat to um, strategist and um, attorney Kendall Moore. Um, what did you see with some of these state policies passed that not only affect your area in Brevard, but um, what about the major economic impacts that affect the whole state? And uh, same question to you, Attorney Shaw. We'll start with uh, the wiser Attorney Moore. Uh, thank you, Brother Drake, for uh, uh, certainly having us tonight and to our uh, uh, Florida State Representative Tostin and the brothers on the panel, as well as the brothers in attendance, certainly appreciate um, the opportunity. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Brother Simmons started going down a, a path that it is very hard to avoid based upon what we saw, you know, massive dollars in the budget this year, $112 billion dollars, you know, grew grew 10% last year and another 10% uh, uh, this year. So there, there appeared to be no shortage of one thing, and that was money. And certainly when you have that much money, you hope and, and expect and press that uh, uh, black and brown folks like ourselves would, would be the beneficiaries and recipients of such. And it wasn't just the, the 112 billion, it was the other four and a half billion dollars of federal funds that were available you know, by and through the situation that was going on with coronavirus and, and, and other things that were out there. And certainly uh, uh, our Black Caucus, I mean, I know that uh, Representative Benjamin and, and Senator Roussan that were on uh, uh, night one, you know, talked about just how hard they fought out there. And, and, and yes, you know, there were sales tax holidays and other tax holidays that are going to help folks. Yes, there were, you know, added homestead exemptions. Yes, there were, I think, five and three eighths percent uh, 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 pay raise for state employees, you know, some money towards education, even some money towards colleges. But still, with that amount of money that was available, uh, the fair share for black and brown folks still was not there in this session as diligently and as uh, uh, hard as folks that were looking out for us continued to fight. You know, when you start to talk about uh, uh, education, yes, you did see an increase in per student spending, but certainly our schools could use a significant amount of additional dollars, not just on per student spending and facility base, but just so many different ways that the legislature could have invested greater money in education. I mean, certainly, uh, uh, many HBCU grads on this on this uh, call, the, the push by the caucus on behalf of our Florida-based HBCUs, who certainly could benefit. And there were, you know, some dollars given to community colleges and some additional dollars given to colleges, but certainly not the dollars that our HBCUs deserve for the students that they are consistently and continually uh, uh, educating on our behalf. Um, certainly, you know, you did have that that financial literacy. Uh, uh, act that was passed that certainly any time any student, black, brown, or otherwise, has an opportunity to increase their financial IQ. I think that's going to be beneficial farther down the road. But unfortunately, so many dollars that were there and, and bills that were passed were not specifically targeted to benefit uh, uh, our people. Um, you know, you don't want to end on a negative uh, uh, impact, but I, I think um, uh, uh, Brother Simmons really pointed out that so many things unfortunately negatively impacted us economically. And it's hard, although they were not intended to be uh, uh, economic pieces of legislation, uh, don't say gay, stop woke act, you know what I mean? The things out there and the ultimate impacts that they will have on our people. Uh, I saw a little bit earlier today when you've got, you know, Marriott and Hilton and American Airlines and Airbnb saying that it's going to be more and more and more difficult for them to recruit employees in Florida and to bring people from around the country to Florida for good, well-paying jobs that our black and brown folks could benefit from because they're scared if they can even talk about race. They wonder if they get discriminated against if they'll have an opportunity to file an employment discrimination claim. Those kinds of things, even though not intended to be uh, economic, Brother Drake, are certainly going to have a challenging fiscal impact on the black and brown people uh, uh, of Florida. And so I, I know that uh, uh, this year there was more money. Uh, hopefully we may see the same in future years 
but I know if we on, on this call, and as I heard on night one and I heard on night two, and you'll hear it repeated here tonight, I'm sure on many occasions, continue to push, push and fight, particularly in the economic space and realm, because the economics are going to be the foundation, uh, certainly for our people to move forward. Powerful comments, and we'll um, we'll go to you, Attorney Shaw, with the same question. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Brother State Representative and Brother Drake, for having me on. Um, a lot of good stuff was already said, but I just want to put some numbers on this. Um, Eight hundred million dollars in the budget was allocated for increasing teacher salaries. That sounds like a lot of money until you understand that even with that money, our teachers are near, near the bottom of teacher pay in the country. Um, $337 million de dedicated for affordable housing out of a $112 billion budget is not only unacceptable, it's an insult, uh, and it is merely window dressing so that y'all stop screaming about why we need more affordable housing money. That is meant just to placate you. And uh, Brother Moore talked about the tax holidays. $600 million was dedicated to tax holidays. $300 million went to affordable housing. Now you tell me if you think that is fair. Um, $9.8 million went to improve the infrastructure of state correctional facilities. I don't know if anybody's on this call has been voluntarily to a correctional facility, but $9.8 million is not enough. I have toured prisons around this state uh, and they shouldn't be in the way that they are. Um, and I understand that everybody wants to, it's inmates in there and they ought to live tough and we want to act like that, but. It shouldn't leak in inmates' cells when it rains. Uh, the warden shouldn't have to have pots in his or her office when it rains in a prison. There shouldn't be a cavalcade of cars outside because they can't afford to fix all the cars that have broken down. $9.8 million is totally woefully insufficient, particularly when $600 million is going to tax cuts. And I, I keep saying that amount because in Tallahassee, there's always money for certain things. There's always money for private schools. There's always money to build new prisons. And there's always money for tax cuts. There's never money for anything else. Everything else is up in the air. Everything else changes. But I can guarantee you those three things, there's always a lot of money in the budget somehow for them. Uh, and listen, I, you show me a budget, I'll show you the state's priorities. And so regardless of what people say when they're behind a podium, regardless of what you may get in your mailbox about a candidate, regardless of what digital ad comes on when you get on TikTok or Instagram, people that run this state believe that tax packages are more important than fundamental things that this state needs. And I'm not here to get political on you. I'm just giving you facts. I just told you $600 million for tax cuts Half of that is what we did for affordable housing. And Florida is one of the worst places in the country for affordable housing. We are one of the worst educational systems when it comes to per student spending, per pupil spending, when it comes to teacher pay, when it comes to all these things. Uh, and so we've never seen a tax cut we didn't like. But uh, when it comes to other things, I think we really got to get ourselves together. And, and uh, you know, Brother uh, Simmons and Brother Moore told you that um, those are just the budget I was talking about. It's not even the other nasty stuff that went on that I, we, we could get into, but we won't. But I'll end with you know, the financial literacy that everyone is hailing. Essentially what the state has told you is that we can talk about credit cards in a school, but we can't talk about black history. Now you tell me what kind of sense you think that makes. I'm done. Um, end it on an exclamation uh, point. Drake. Thank you. Yes, yes. Can I, can I just say something about the financial literacy part? Yes. And I, I love that that has become a topic of conversation and people are celebrating that. That's cool. But I was a teacher. I was a government teacher. One half of the school year before this legislation, the first, one of the semesters you teach government. The second semester, it is economics and financial literacy. It, that is a graduation requirement for seniors. You have to pass both those semesters. So it was already kind of being taught. Right, I think they are making it, a, trying to make it stronger, but there was already a curriculum for it. So it's just, what I was trying to allude to was that there was a lot of things that happened, but nothing addressing, really addressing kitchen table issues in a way that people see some improvement in their everyday life. All right, thank you for adding that. Um, you know, I'm big on it. Um, I think y'all know I'm founder and CEO of Bill Black Daily LLC, where 
uh, we push economics to the forefront continually. Um, so the next question will be directed towards our uh, 24th state representative of the Florida statewide organization, Mr. Darren Tolston. Uh, Brother Tolston, um, hearing these answers from our distinguished panel um, about all the economic impacts, what opportunities do you see for Omega to spread this information uh, throughout the state and potentially throughout the district and uh, nation? Uh, thank you, Brother Drake. Uh, thank you to the panelists for joining us tonight. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, I, I can hear the frustration from my brothers um, as you all gave your answers to those questions that Brother Drake presented to you. Um, and, and from my perspective, um, again, from, from what Brother Simmons said, it sounded like a, a whole lot of things. You, there were more things that didn't happen than things that did happen. Um, and from my perspective um, in Omega, you know, we need to know those things. Um, Omega is about, you know, spreading the information and we can't just have events like this where, you know, this event, you know, while good to spread the information here, we got to continue to spread that information to the people in our community um, and let them know that, you know, the legislator isn't doing the things that they need to be doing to, to focus on their communities. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we're going out to our school systems and we're going to the churches, the community centers. Uh, the barbershops, wh wherever. Um, we need to share that information with the other than the nine organizations, let them know that we need to continue, as Brother Moore said, to, to push and fight, to push and fight that, to make sure that our legislators are aware of the needs that we have and, and push the, the issues that are, you know, germane to us and not, you know, some of the issues that you mentioned as far as, you know, the you know, they can't say, you know, certain words in the school system, can't teach certain things and, um, you know, things of that nature. We need to make sure that, you know, like I said, the legislators are, you know, putting the money into our school systems, into prison, prisons and, and things of that nature, things that are, like I said, you know, concerned to our areas. Um, it's, and again, it's, it's bigger than, you know, what we can do as Omega. We need to make sure that, you know, we have the village mentality. You know, if we have the information, we need to get that information out to the communities. We need to make sure that we're going again, you know, we have plenty of brothers that are educators, you know, take that information to the schools and make sure that they they are aware, you know, make sure that they educate their families on the things. Um, you know, we are so used to, we get all this information when it comes time for elections, you know, people that say that this person didn't do this or that person didn't do this or, you know, what, what people are trying to do when it comes time to election time. But we need to know this information throughout the year, um, things that aren't being done so that we can, you know, remember it when it does come time for election so that we can't have the, the wool pull over our eyes or whatnot, so. Uh, Brother Drake, I think you're on mute. Let me slip and um, thank you for that, Brother State Rep. Um, uh, that's encouraging to hear, I'm sure, to all the brothers uh, tuning in as well as the brothers on the panel. Just immediate follow on, um, just hearing you, what you just said, um, does that give give us, um, I guess, a good hypothesis to say you want to bring some a form like this back in the fall? Definitely, without a doubt. Um, we're looking forward to not only having something in the fall. Um, again, we're we're looking forward to actually coming out up to the Capitol and and going through the halls of the Capitol and, and pushing these issues. Um, again, it, it's so much bigger than just Omega. We have our, you know, mentorship groups. Um, Brother King is one of the, the main advocates of our mentorship group here in Tallahassee, um, here um, with the, the Lamp Lighters program. We need money funding for our mentorship programs. Um, there are so many different issues. And, and if we're made aware of those issues, we can, you know, push that fight to the Capitol, to the people at the legislature. We can work with our other organizations, um, whether it be the the other divine now organizations, or just like I said, you know, educating the people in the communities to know how they can go ahead and talk to their legislators, how they can talk to their representatives, um, so that they are aware that, you know, they have the power to, to make change, so. Thank you, Brother State Rep. Uh, with that being said, let's go to our next question. And uh, this is for everybody. Um, um, actually, uh, uh, before we go to the, that next question, um, uh, we have the opportunity to have our uh, duly elected seventh vice, uh, seventh district, uh, district representative, Brother Reginald Harris on the line. And uh, Brother Harris would like to bring us greetings. Uh, 
Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> let me say uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, thank you again, uh, Brother Drake. My apologies for my tardiness. Um, been hearing a little bit of the, the conversation as it uh, pertains to just opportunities to leverage uh, the things that they were speaking on from an e economic impact. And that's one of the things where, it, as it relates to the seventh district, we have the Policy Institute, not only those economic impacts that you all see there in Florida, but we want to ensure that we can try to uh, leverage that Policy Institute across the seventh district so that we can ensure that economic impact is felt uh, throughout the district. Uh, hats off to each one of you, uh, Brother Toast, and I know I heard you say that you definitely want to bring back things like this, such as forums, and we certainly be interested in pushing um, this agenda as well from a district level. So hats off to each of you. Again, greetings, uh, and let me know if any way that I can help. All right. Thank you, Brother DR. Now, we look forward to fellowshipping in a uh, grand fashion in Atlanta <laughs> next week. Indeed, indeed. Set it out. <laughs> All right. So, um, so let's move to our next question. This question is for all panelists. And um, the question is, um, how does your office or, or you as an advocate assist in assuring that resources, including dollars, are allocated fairly to black and brown communities? Oh, we'll start with you, Vice Mayor. All right, so at the, uh, well, before I go there, the one thing I wanna say if I can for um, the, the uh, state reps um, comment is that I would love for the D9, I would love for our fraternity to have a stronger voice in the whatever's going on in uh, Florida as far as um, nonpartisan positions, right? And because I know you can't necessarily get into the partisan stuff, but your voice is still very powerful. The collective voice is very powerful. And when there are things that are happening, good or bad, saying you support something, putting out something that is like, we support these things because it aligns with our pillars or it aligns with you know our mandates and things like that are very very powerful because a lot of times people are just looking to see those that look like them represent them with their you know with their voices and pushing that up to the, the surface so i'll just say that um the second thing is the, the answer to your question brother drake at the city level um so in a city like coral springs that's now minority majority by one percent um when we're in the room and we're going through our budgets and we're looking at the events we're doing and the community programs we're doing, because at the city level, it's really about your community events, right? Because, um, uh, you know, we're picking up trash, we're making sure water's clean, we're doing more quality, quality of life stuff. And so for the areas where we start to see a concentration of black and brown folks, I want to make sure that we got trash cans in those areas, right? I want to make sure that those areas look nice. I want to make sure that when they're doing street sweeping, are these streets getting you know swept regularly, right? Are we over patrolling in the black and brown areas or is it spread out? Where are our resources going? So making sure that the resources are being spent evenly, not in the heavily, you know, not in a negative way that he um, heavily burdens black and brown areas, but making sure that they're being taken care of. Going back to the programming part, um, we are on our way to having our third Juneteenth program. And again, if you remember the bio, I was the first black commissioner elected in the city. And so when I brought Juneteenth to them three years ago, the staff blessed their hearts. They worked really hard. I love those people. They were like, they had never heard of Juneteenth. And so, you know, and being in that position, you know, I don't, I'm not going to yell at folks because they don't know what they don't know. But what they did, which was a great sign for me, is that they went and did their research. And when they came back, they're like, oh my God, why weren't we celebrating this before? You know? <laughs> and so, and so we had our first virtual one during the pandemic. We had our first our, our first outside one last year, and now we're having our third one in there. And now it's a budgeted city event. So now when people are coming out and they're coming to court, they were like, last year, they were like, I cannot believe that we are having all these Black people in Coral Springs. Because if you're from Broward, you understand the reputation Coral Springs has. And the fact that we were doing that. So it's, it's being in those rooms when the decisions are being made, and using your lived experience to make sure that folks that look like you uh, are being looked at, uh, looked after, making sure we have community pop-up events. Because my biggest thing is in those communities, in the black and brown communities, we have a negative view generally of government. And so I want to make sure we're going in there 
And we're saying that we're here, but also we're giving you resources, community resources. We're making sure you're fed. We're making sure, you know, you know that your city, your city sees you and is paying attention to you. And I'm just, I'm really passionate about this stuff. That's why I speak like this. So it ain't really necessary frustration. It's just, I love this stuff. So. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we're going to swing it to uh, our brother, Attorney Shaw, who, who's a trailblazer as well. I think y'all heard him in his bio, the only black person to be at the top of the ticket for the attorney general race in Florida history. Thank you, uh, I, brother Simmons. That was nice. I am frustrated, uh, so you can uh, <laughs> you can you can try to run away from it, but we hear it in your voice, brother. But I, I will say, at the city level, it's probably you do have an easier time, and it's a little better. I'm just going to talk about it from my time in the legislature. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, you can try to get things in the budget. Uh, and I shouldn't be a surprise to you. I was a Democrat. And so a Democrat, trying, a black Democrat trying to get stuff in the budget wasn't very easy. It was possible. But the issue is, and I'm going to be very candid, you might have to take some votes that you didn't want to take. Um, and if you just heard us talk about the budget, when I was in the legislature, I voted against the budget every year I could. And I voted against these tax packages every opportunity I could. And I was one of a very few number that did that. And you may ask yourself, well, why would you vote against tax breaks? It's because it was my opinion we couldn't afford $600 million in tax cuts when our schools were underfunded, when our jails were overcrowded, when uh, we had all these other in infrastructure problems and we got money to give away, although it's valuable, uh, to disaster preparedness, freedom week, and tool time. Now, yeah, it's great to have a tax cut to go purchase tools at Lowe's and Home Depot. But damn, there's no money for uh, more money for public schools and roads. and So I just, uh, I never voted for the budget, which I'm bringing it back to the answer. I didn't get much in the budget uh, because I did not vote for it. And so if you are a legislator uh, and you want to get your things in the budget, oftentimes, as was told to me one time, well, Representative Shaw, we look forward to your positive vote on the budget. And when I told them that they were unlikely to receive that positive vote, they essentially told me that my money in the budget wasn't going to be received favorably. Now, that's just my, that's how I dealt with it. Other people will get the money in the budget because they think that's more important. I'm not saying it's either, I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. I'm just giving you the information as to how these things happen, particularly when you're a Democrat. To get stuff in the budget, Oftentimes, you're going to have to maybe do some some votes that you might be a little uncomfortable with. You might have to do some things, and it's just different approaches to how you do it. But um, you don't get stuff in the budget because it's good. Let me just tell you that. You don't get stuff in the budget just because you're going to save all the little black kids in your county, and you think Tallahassee is just going to think it's wonderful, and they can't wait to save your program. That's not how this works. Uh, this work, this is a give and take. This is a legislative process. You go to Tallahassee and you speak to chairs of committees and you speak to staff and you go talk to the leaders of the house of the other party and you try to get them to buy into your, uh, the, what you want to bring back to your community and, and, and that's a give and take process. And so what are you willing to give uh, in order to get receive that money? That's where the rubber meets the road and it's not an easy process. It's not a pretty process. There's also no right or wrong way to engage in that process is what I'm trying to tell you. There's, there's some people that believe bringing that money home is what I was sent to do. And that's if, if that's what they ran on, that's fine. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Uh, I didn't. I told them I was going to go up there and raise hell and that I probably wouldn't bring money home. But I told my voters that when I went there. And so the process is not pretty. Uh, it's not easy. It's also not easy to follow if you're a member of the public. Uh, if you are not someone who is a lobbyist that does this, that knows what's going on in Tallahassee, otherwise you will not follow it, and that's by design. Uh, there is no way for the public to follow line by line what goes in the budget. It's, it's impossible, and that's by design. That's because uh, all of this is a give and take. All of this is uh, the carrot and the stick approach as to what gets in the budget. So that is, that is just the background on the Tallahassee budget. I appreciate Brother Simmons being able to get good stuff on a city level, but I look forward to him coming to Tallahassee at some point uh, and engaging in this free for all that they got going on. So, so we've heard from uh, a local uh, local vice mayor, local legislator. We heard from a immediate past state legislator, and um, said that only if outside of being an elected office, only a lobbyist can understand it. 
Now we'll go to a lobbyist, uh, that being uh, Brother Kendall Moore. And Kendall, I believe you went to Morehouse, did you not? That I did. And uh, the, the same question to you, as I guess from the lobbyist perspective, um, how do you go about as an advocate um, ensuring that monies get brought back to black and brown communities? Uh, let, let, let me say this, Brother Drake, before I answer, uh, Brother Shaw said it as well. Uh, about Vice Mayor Simmons, uh, he and I had a chance to meet at a city meeting uh, a few years ago, and uh, uh, the, that brother has had not only mass enthusiasm for Omega, but the same thing for politics and making change. And uh, for those of us that have been in this business for decades, brother, we're happy to see it and uh, keep pushing. Like, like Sean said, you're going to pick up where we leave it off, and you got a long way uh, that you can take this thing. So now happy and excited about it. Um, I, I tell you what, Brother Drake, uh, uh, you heard it from a state perspective. Let me say something that I think we heard on night one and night two and, and give it from a perspective that I try to give to local individuals. Yes, there's lots of state politics and yes, there's uh, uh, things that we can do on a federal level, but there's so much happening around the corner from your house that impacts your life with your city council, with your county commission and with your school board, uh, the way your kids are educated, whether the pothole in front of your, your house is paved, you know, the quality of the water that, that, that comes to your home are all issues that are decided around the corner from your house by a person who probably shops at a Publix or a Winn-Dixie not too far from you. And so we heard a lot about political participation on night one and two, and, and we'd be remiss if we didn't, didn't uh, uh, continue to repeat that. And I've, I've been telling uh, uh, people who are elected officials, people who want to be elected officials, just people who are, you know, just, just out in the streets fighting for what is right. You know, I, I tell them something I think they can remember. And I tell them it's the four quick lessons that we learn from that little boy in the Bible who had the uh, few fish and, and the loaves of bread. You know, and I said, you know, what is it you can learn from that little boy about politics? The first thing is he was present. Too many of our folks don't show up. Right. They, they like to sit on the sidelines and, and, and say who should do what. I think state representatives say we got a lot of folks out there talking from the sidelines that aren't willing to jump in and get involved. And doesn't necessarily mean you got to run for office, but you got to be present. You have to show your face. You have to attend meetings. You have to make your voice known and heard. So the, the, the first thing he do, did was be present. The second thing he did was he was willing to participate. You can't show up and do nothing. You have to have a willingness to get involved and get engaged at some level. Even if you don't have to run for office, you at least need to volunteer, give some time, some energy, some effort, some dollars if you have it uh, uh, toward this process that we are intending uh, to do to try to make, make change in our community. So, you know, present first, second is participate. Third thing is, if you remember, that little boy didn't come uh, uh, empty handed. He came prepared. And so before you get there, there's some homework you can do, um, you know, re reading the newspaper, a little studying here, talk to people who've been around. Uh, before I ran for office, uh, 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 there were two bros who, who had been on the city council for 25 and 30 years, respectively, who took as much time as I needed to help me understand how I could make a difference, whether I wanted to be an elected official or just a community advocate. And so the opportunity that they told me was make a difference by coming prepared. You know, an elected official knows the people who know what they're talking about, right? Somebody who's took a little time to study the issue and comes to the table with, with a, a solid background, as well as some suggestions of how they could change. And then the last but not least is once we all to get together, you got to believe in what I call the fourth P is, is that together we can kind of believe in and change the promise, right? It's, it's one of us or two of us fighting. That's okay. But collectively, if, if, all of us across this state, across the seventh district are willing to band together, work hard, volunteer time, put some money toward it, share ideas. We can certainly move the needle, not only globally, politically, but specifically, as you talked about tonight, Brother Drake, in an economic fashion that could change the world for our people going forward forever. I just want to follow Reverend Dr. Brother Moore here <laughs> and just uh, I just want to add one thing. And that is the easiest way to participate in this process is to vote. And uh, that is the basic, the, the, the minimal thing that you could do to participate in this process. Uh, and there are steps above that that you can do, but uh, so many of us are unwilling to even engage in that first step to vote. 
yet our churches, uh, at our barbecues, at our weekend events, we welcome these politicians uh, into our communities, don't know what they do, don't know that they go to Tallahassee and kick us in the behind, don't know that they lie to us in our face and do something different when they're, when they're on another side of town, don't know that they're not going to come back to our communities until they're coming to ask for the vote again. And you know why? It's because we don't demand it. Uh, and so there are a lot of things that we can do ourselves to also make sure that we're holding people accountable. But I just want to add that. Thank you, brother. And brother Drake, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna add too. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit. So I want to connect because we're talking economics. I want to connect the local to the state. So every city has funding requests for the budget for projects throughout the city. So for instance, in my city, we have this one building, our public safety building, that houses all of our emergency food supplies, water, everything. In the event of a disaster, we have this place where we can work out of as our like emergency center. Well, that building was on its been on its deathbed for like 15 years. And for the last four years, we have been asking for money to get that done. And three years ago, every year in the budget, it gets it gets vetoed out, line item vetoed out, cross gone. And three years ago, we tried to do a bond to pay for it, which ultimately adds to the debt service, which ultimately adds to the budget. And then if you need more money, then you're gonna raise taxes, economics, right? So that bond failed, and then I have a visitor. That bond failed, and so now we're going back to the governor again, or going back to the governor again to get it in the legislation to pass to get this um, get this uh, building paid for. Well, it gets canceled. So think about this: if every city has a very important public safety project or public works project that they need, that's going to help you know keep their residents safe and secure and getting clean drinking water and things like that, if they don't have the funding for it, and they're asking the state for it and it gets vetoed out, they gotta go get the money from somewhere and guess where they're gonna get it from? The residents by raising your taxes, right? So these are the things that are happening as um, um, Brother Shaw had said, as well as Brother Moore, it's like so much is happening that people aren't seeing it, but it all comes back to the economics. You talk about your roads not being paved. Okay, you're trying to go to work to go make some money, but then your tire gets messed up. <laughs> economics, right? So I just want that. that. Was informative, but also a little scary the way y'all woo. Um, so I think I'm going to ask the state rep if you want to chime in on, I guess, from Omega Statewide Organization, how are we providing resources uh, to our communities? Uh, well, Brother Drake, and, and as you brothers know, I mean, our fraternity, um, uh, you know, we don't have to deal with the, the budgetary issues that, you know, you brothers deal with on your levels. Um, while we do deal with budgets, um, we have mandated programs. Um, we have programs in which, you know, the fraternity participates in, you know, scholarship, um, you know, and, you know, on the chapter level, on, you know, the state um, with organizations such as ourselves, our, our district. And at the international level, we, we continuously give out scholarship dollars to, to members and non-members. So um, we also have our social action programs in which, you know, we allocate various funds for doing things in, in our communities. Um, we also have our college endowment fund initiative um, and the fraternity is always committed to, you know, providing um, funds for education. So, you know, we, like I said, we, we don't have the limitations that you unfortunately have with regards to, you know, some of the things that you mentioned earlier. Uh, our grand boss was brother David Marion. He's committed to, to giving monies to HBCUs. Um, through his HBCU giving campaign, um, we are giving out a number of, um, you know, monetary donations to HBCUs throughout, um, th throughout our districts. Um, our, our DR brother Harris will be giving out donations um, next week in Atlanta, as brother Drake mentioned, um, he will be giving out you know, those um, donations to HBCUs within our district, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. So fortunately, like I said, the fraternity had a vision a long time ago to have these mandated programs and, and to serve the people in our community. So um, we look forward to these efforts that we do. And, and honestly, we, we need to work, like I said earlier, more with you brothers to, to find out what ways we can help you um, not only to, to get you the funding that you need, to, but to also hopefully, you know, give us the funding that we can, you know, shovel out to the community, so. All right. Brother DR, did you want to chime in briefly? Hey, Brother Drake, I, I think 
Brother State Tolson has really captured a, a, a lot of the essence of what we have as it relates to Omega. I, I think holistically, though, from a policy perspective, we can do more um, with brothers like the, the ones that you have on, here on the panel. If we ensure uh, what's pertinent, what we need to be looking for to ensure that those black and, black and brown dollars, what we need to be fighting for there on the Hill, they ensure those black and brown dollars are within our various communities, then we can can make the conscious effort to be out there and be pushing the agenda that's right for us. Uh, so, I mean, to, to add to his, not only those mandated programs, but everything we do, we're always looking for extra effort to be able to do it. I think these days on the, uh, on the Capitol, along with every state or statewide organization, having those days on the Capitol are uh, critical and vital to the success of what we do in the community. So. All right, thank you, Brother DR. There you heard from our state rep and DR. They're committed to being advocates, um, continuing to serve community and uh, working uh, to, to push positive policy. Uh, that being said, we're gonna deviate a little bit to another aspect of economics. Um, we're gonna talk about the economics of getting into elected office. Um, Brother Moore, Brother Shaw, no stranger to this. Brother Simmons, you've been deep in it as well. Um, so the question, I mean, we see great candidates all the time and we see them, not have enough money. So, so the question is how, how major is fundraising versus having a solid platform and being a good person um, and getting into these elected offices? And we can start with um, any, well, let's, let's start with um, the, the wisdom of Kendall Moore. You got, you know, Brother Drake, the, um... Uh, one, one interesting thing about about having a desire to run for office and campaigning, um, you have the advent of social media and so many other things. But I think in so many ways, um, you've got the vice mayor Simmons running today and some of us that ran 20 years ago. At the end of the day, I think the crux of successful campaigns are based on two very basic things. Uh, doors and dollars, as I like to say. I say doors in the sense of if I take a person who has a solid platform and something to say and place that person face to face with a voter, there's a high likelihood that they can convince that person to vote for them before they walk away. All right. And so that's that's the doors part. Direct voter contact is still the name of the game at the end of the day. Uh, I, I, I was joking with the vice mayor, you put that enthusiasm in front of a voter, the voter's likely to say yes. But at some point, as, as the population continues to grow, and particularly the number of voters that you have to touch, even in local elections today, it does require dollars to continue to get your message out. Um, you know, we, we tell in, in, in the lobbying business, we tell people who'd like to be candidates that a, a, a campaign is nothing more than an organized effort to influence voter choice. You are attempting to influence a person's action on the day when they cast their vote. And ultimately, if you don't see them face to face, or even if you do, the reminder and the opportunity is dollars. And if, if uh, uh, somebody even in a city has to talk to five or 10,000 voters, you know, today that craziness that some of you say gets into your mailbox, eight and a half by 11, full color, double-sided with pictures and a lot of crazy things to say, if those are 50 cents a piece, um, you need to talk to 10,000 voters, that's five grand for every time you see one of those, you know what I mean, in your mailbox. And then you say, well, I got four of those from that campaign. Well, that's $20,000 in mail in a, in a very, very small city race. But then you start to talk about some of our larger urban areas, much less a, a, a statewide race as uh, uh, Sean Shaw has taken on in his life. It is a significant amount of money that's required. And people will often say, well, I, you know, I, I don't have it. You have the opportunity to give it or get it, right? Some people are writing checks and self-funding these days. I think it's it is changing the system because we do have so many self-funders at this point that people that have been preparing for years and or have the family money to set aside to write a check to fund their campaign. But the other opportunity is raising the money. And you can be taught to do that, as we call it in my office, is, is dialing for dollars. I can, and, and, and it probably makes Brother Simmons and Brother Shaw cringe when they hear that, that, you know, sitting in a, in a, in a chair at a, at a desk with nothing more than a 
a list of names and numbers and, a, and the, the words you need to say in a glass of water and dialing for hours to, to tell people who you are, what you think, and uh, why you think that your platform is important and asking them if they would ultimately be willing to invest in, in your race. And so there's no way around the fact that it takes money. Can you win potentially on a, on a, on a shoestring budget? Can you win in a 100% grassroots effort? It certainly can be done, but the economics dramatically um, uh, increase your chances. I will leave you with this. Across the state, we have so many different uh, areas and, and some of us, um, uh, uh, where I live here in Brevard County is, is even different than the Brother Simmons. I always say I live in Brevard, not in Broward. Uh, I, I live in a city that's 10% African-American. Uh, uh, I live in a county that is plus 17 or 20 on Republican registration, right? It's, there are no minority uh, uh, majority seats. There are no Democratic majority seats. And so in, in order to have your voice heard, it does take dollars to be able to make that happen. And uh, uh, certainly the vice mayor and the other electeds, Brother Drake, that you've had this week uh, uh, don't have the time and often for ethical reasons don't have the opportunity to be able to assist. But some of us on the outside are happy to offer you know, it, it, advice and thoughts of what we've been through, the, the way that we are helping candidates. If somebody's interested today in running for office or you think you might be interested in the next five or 10 years, please reach out. We can help because the preparation component will allow you to have the economics that you need to get it done. If you decide you want to run tomorrow and you jump in it, it might be a little bit tough. Um, you know, when, 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 when Sean Shaw decided to run for statewide office, it was a year ahead of time that he showed up at my front door of my office and said, hey, brother, here's what I intend to do. Uh, uh, I could really use your help. And it's going to take me this amount of time to raise these amount of dollars. So the preparation for the economics is something that can help as well, as well as, like I said, reaching out to folks who have done it or have the opportunity to help and assist. And I think those of us uh, who are not currently elected and working in this business would be willing to offer any brother of Omega the advice that we have, particularly if you were interested in running for elected office. Thank you. And we'll, we'll go to um, attorney brother Shaw. Yeah, brother, brother Moore is exactly right. I would just, I would just say the answer depends on the office you're running for. Is essentially what he was saying, right? Uh, you can knock your way to a school board race, city council race. You start getting to county commission, even. You can't meet the amount of voters that are going to engage in that race. You can't meet them all. And when you start getting to the point that you can't meet every voter, that's when it starts getting expensive. And so. Uh, even if it's county commission, that's a lot of voters. But for the house race I ran in, uh, I was able to, a combination of knock doors and raise money. It was a, a smaller, but a state Senate race. It's very difficult for you to knock enough doors to win that race. So you start getting higher and higher and the economics change. But <clears throat> Brother Moore is, is absolutely right. Once you start getting to the, the other, for example, I raised $5 million for the attorney general race. And that's the most anyone has ever raised for attorney general in the history of attorney general. And I got outspent two to one. So that starts telling you the scale of what it takes to run for when you start talking about these major offices. And so it takes preparation. Uh, like anything else in life, it, it ain't easy. Uh, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's hard. It's not fun to sit in an office. Uh, Brother Simmons has called me during call time before and gotten me to give money when he was dialing for dollars. It's, it's not easy. It's one of the reasons I'm on this panel right now and I'm not running for office because I don't want to be in that room begging for money all day. And I try to tell, and I know Brother Moore feels this, when someone comes to you and says, I'm, I want to run for office, give me some advice. And I essentially try to give them the advice. How much do you think this race is going to cost? Uh, and if, if the answer is I'm going to run a grassroots campaign, I cut the meeting pretty short because that's just an unrealistic person. And I, I, I don't have to, you know, I just don't have time for that kind of unrealistic stuff. But if someone has done their homework, and knows what the budget is. These are all public. It's very public. You will you can go to divisions of elections. It's ain't rocket science. And if you're running for office, you should have done this already and find out what the budget is. And I'm going to ask you, well, how are you going to raise $100,000? And uh, they will say, well, I've got a plan to do this and a plan to do that. And, and I'm very specific that um, that plan is not going to ribbon cuttings. It's not going to chamber meetings. 
It's not going to Tiger Bay. It's not doing what you think running for office is. What people think running for office is, is going to all these openings and, and wonderful things and the, and the neighborhood meetings. That is not what running for office is. Running for office is begging for money all day. And then after people won't answer your call at about five or six, then go into community events until eight or nine. That's what running for office is. And, and you got to be realistic about this. It's not what people think it is. People think it's, it's something different than it is. When I was running for attorney general, I would get up about eight o'clock. I would beg for money till lunch. I would go to lunch with a donor or I would have some kind of fundraiser. I would then go to an office and raise money from four to five from till five o'clock. I would then have a fundraiser that afternoon. I would then go to dinner after that fundraiser with a major donor to try to beg them for a big check. Then I would get in the car and someone would drive me to another city. I would get to that city 11 o'clock at night. I check into the hotel, go to the bar, have a glass of wine and go to bed. And then I would wake up in that next city and do it all again. You didn't, you That's didn't what say running what you, for office You didn't say is. what you was doing in the car. You didn't say what you was doing in the car. You, you brother, sleeping? you go get <laughs> begging for money in the car. You are correct. But that's what running for office is. It's not, you know, you do a press conference every now and then. That's an hour. That's an hour out of call time. You would do, maybe I would talk to a Democrat, a Democratic group. That's an hour. My entire day was focused on fundraising and everything else was extra to that. If I couldn't, if my day of fundraising was impacted dramatically by me trying to get to a location, guess what? I didn't go to that location. My schedule was dominated by where and how I was going to raise money. And I think people don't sometimes understand that. They think it's, well, I've got a great platform. If I can just talk to enough people and if I can go to enough churches, that ain't what. Well, when I ran for office the first time, I lost. And I know why now. It's because I did what was easy. It's because it's easy to go to community events. It's easy to do things where you think people are. I could fill my day with things that look good on paper. I could fill my day by going to a community event from five to six, and then going to a neighborhood association meeting, and then going to, I could fill my day with it. And I could go to bed at night saying, man, I had a good day of campaigning, raise zero dollars. That's not a good day of campaigning. This money is so fundamental to this. It's the most important thing. Uh, your, your platform could be great. If no one hears about it, why does it matter? You could be a great person. If no one knows who you are, why does it matter? All these things could be wonderful. If nobody knows who you are, it doesn't matter. You will lose to somebody who's trash, but is in someone's mailbox four times, as Brother Moore said. And so it's a combination. It's not all money, because you might, if it was all money, then Jeff Green would have beat Andrew Gillum. He didn't. It's not all money. Um, it is money in combination with other things, but I can guarantee you, if you don't have money, that you're not going to be on that final list. But it's a combination, and, and it's the best candidates are able to do a lot of things well. They can raise money. They can speak well. When they meet people, people like them. Um, they have an ability. That, candidates that are able to do a lot of things are the ones that do well. But I, I just always tell people running for office is not what you see on TV. It is sitting in an office for 70% of your day, asking people that you don't know who for money, and then asking the people that you do know for more money, and then asking your friends <laughs> for even more money than that. That's what running for office is. And if you, if you don't like to ask for money, then I, I hate to tell you, you might need to do something else. Um, but I, I'll end with this. You get used to it after about the first week. It's very uncomfortable calling people for money. You get real, oh, and you, you get people on the phone and then you don't ask because you don't think. People are used to getting asked for money on the phone, right? They're used to it. So once you get over the hump and you get comfortable with it, that's when uh, you'll be able to get to where you need to be. But it's, um, I know people come up to you, Brother Moore, and I know people come up to you, uh, Brother Simmons, and ask for advice. And that's, I'm very candid with them. If you if you don't have a plan for this first $100,000 or $50,000 and you think that you're just going to grassroots your way to victory, I think you're doing yourself a disservice and it's unrealistic. Brother Drake, before, before the vice mayor speaks, let me, let me just say it happened exactly today. Just what um, uh, Brother Shaw just said. Uh, uh, a young brother came to my office and said that he was interested in running. And just as Brother Shaw said, I asked the first question, which was, how much is it going to take for you to win this race? And 
it's a threshold question that we're going to ask because the first thing it tells me is if you have any clue, right? And so his number was about 10% of what the actual number would be. And because I knew him and he grew up here locally around and I, I pulled him to the side and I said, brother, when you give that answer and you're knocking on doors, the door is going to be closed because they're going to know you have no clue. And he asked me a single question. Well, how should I have known that? I didn't know you before and know that I could come ask. One thing that you can do if you're interested in running for office, every campaign contribution given in this state is a matter of public record. If you want to run for city council or county commission or school board or state house or whatever the case may be, you can quickly and easily find through electronic internet search the data to understand the last 10 people who've run for this office or the last 10 people who won, you can find out not only exactly how much they raised, you can find out how much they spent. You know every single person that donated to them and how much because it's a matter of public record. So part of the reason that Brother Shaw said that is not that it just tells us about the economics, but it tells us about the preparation because you didn't do the research to understand the economics. And so it is very, very much available. So I would say to anybody who's watching today, if you've got a desire to do it and you wanna know how much it took for the person to win, you could find that out in the next five minutes. And when you then go out to talk to people about it, they will know and understand that when it should be 50,000 and you say five, that it shows that you've got preparation and the economic realization that I think Brother Shaw was trying to point out. Well, so since we're on this topic, I just wanna let everybody on this call know, uh, I am running for reelection uh, and uh, my and it is the last day of the month and my website is- Brother, I knew this was coming and I, I'm very, so glad you did it because it shows that enthusiasm, brother. I appreciate it. I, I'm listen, glad you did it. But listen, I'm a, I'm a teacher too, so I'm going to connect it. But my website is very easy to remember, joshuasimmons.com. You can donate any amount that you want. It is the end of the month. Give, brothers, give. That's what I will ask, please. All right. So the reason why I said that is when I first, I remember the first day I had to make phone calls to raise money back in 2017, and I was extremely uncomfortable. I mean, extremely uncomfortable because for Black folks, you ask anybody for a dollar, you go, you, <laughs> you're gonna pay for asking for that dollar, right? We are taught not to ask for money, and so it's just like naturally against how we were raised, right? How we're raised, and so, um, one thing I learned very quickly, and, and to what Brother Shad said, as far as you get used to it, you also got to become shameless, you have to become shameless, and you have to ask. And the reason, and, and how I've situated it in my head is you never know who knows who. You never know what who's in the room. You don't know who's connected to who. You don't know what's going on. And when you put yourself out there, you're going to bring something into. You. And a lot of times, a lot of candidates, they start off, you know, in their heads with these really great ideas. But then when they get out there in the public, they kind of get tight because they don't want to, they feel like they don't want to look like a sellout or they don't want to go into those false narratives that they see on social media, what's cool and what's not to be cool and the fight for what's right um you know you don't have to be a terrible person because you're asking for money you don't have to be a terrible per person because of who you took money from right it's all about what you what what you have inside of you what's your integrity how are you right how are you as a person what's your character are you strong in your moral convictions are you really doing what you you're setting out to do so if you're if you want to go and improve lives then that's your mission then you need to do everything you have to do to follow that mission. And it is raising money. And it's not raising money just for money's sake, right? It's because you need to communicate that message to people. In Coral Springs, we're at large. We're 135,000 um, uh, population city, 85,000 eligible voters. That's a lot of people, right? That you have to communicate with. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to see them all. You could go to every grocery store every day. You go to every park every single day. You're not even gonna reach half those people. So you have to raise the money to communicate with that, right? And you have to build those relationships. And then when you do that, when you combine, at least at the local level, with the knocking on doors, with the raising of the money, you're going to spread that. Your network, your reach is going to get wide, right? Your reach is going to get wide. So yes, 
you know, you got to raise money for people to look at something for 10 seconds on the way to the trash can to throw it away. But <laughs> the minute they see your name, you're hoping that you have something good enough there that it sticks for them. Uh, and so I, I think that's the biggest thing I would say for people when they come and say, you know, they want to run for office. I'll tell you, I had an example. There was a neighboring city, a guy, a young brother wanted to run and he had the bright idea. And I'm sorry to be sarcastic, but it was quite ridiculous uh, that he wasn't taking any donations while he was running. Um, and, it, and if anybody knows the city of Parkland, it's a very interesting, interesting thing to say for that type of city that you're not going to raise money for Parkland. And um, he is not a member of he's not an elected official. I'll just say that. Um, I think um, when you're raising the money to, again, a lot of people think that's like, you know, you're not going to take money from this person. You're not going to take this money from this person. Well, the other people are. The other people you, that are running against you are. But it doesn't mean that just because you took money from someone that they bought you. And I think a lot of times, at least for young Black, you know, activists and elected officials, they think because they've taken money from someone or something that now they're automatically bought. No, no one, no one's going to make you or press your finger on that button or make you write this or do this. Right. And then if they choose to not give you money anymore or not, then that's on them. But at the end of the day, you got to be shameless. You got to get used to it. You got to just, it's everything is, is, everything is just trying to make sure you get to that point where you can be the most effective person you can be for the folks that you ask to vote for you. Brother Drake, I, I just want to jump in because this is a really important topic. When I when I saw this on the questions, I was very excited because this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is the difference between want to and you're you got the honorable before your name. This is where that difference comes. And 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 Brother Simmons said it. One, I raised more corporate money when I was in the legislature than almost any other Democrat, and I was rated the worst Democrat for corporations every year I was there. This ain't about selling out to who gives you money. It's about raising money. They're going to give you the money if they think that they need to get in your office. The reason people are donating is so when they call and they want to visit me, that I accept the meeting. That's what the, that's what the money's for, just so they can talk to me about an issue. Because you can damn be sure <laughs> if I called you when I was running for office and you didn't take the call and you're a corporate lobbyist, guess who's not getting a meeting in front of me. You might talk to my staff, but you won't be talking to me. That's what it's not for. If you're doing it right, it's not to vote a certain way. It is not to, to feel better about an issue than you normally would. It's just to get access to you. It's just to accept the meeting. And the well, second Brother, thing. Sean, real quick, while, while we're on that though, can you help us understand, is it more, because money's the game then, is it more impactful then to donate in increments or just make a big chunk? So if the max I can give Brother Simmons is $1,000, should I give five donations of $200? Or is it more impactful just to do that one drop? I'm going to tell you, as long as you max out, I'm, I'm not <laughs> max out. In how it gets to me. Uh, <laughs> I don't really care how it gets to me. If you're going to max out, brother, you're going to get the credit for maxing out. I don't care how it gets to me, uh, quite frankly. But if you don't max out, then I don't want it dribbling and drabbling. Yeah, if you ain't going to max out, just go ahead and give it a chunk and be done. But if you're going to max out, I don't, I don't care how it gets to me. But the, the last part I want to say is this is to Brother Moore's point when someone comes and asks, asks, when if you don't have a plan to be able to raise the amount of money that's required, if you don't see your way to half of it, that's the answer to the question as to whether you're ready to run for office. That means your network isn't quite where it needs to be. It means you don't quite have the connections and the donor network to quite where, that's the answer to the question. You have to have an answer to how you're gonna get to the initial chunk of money. And if you don't have the right answer, it's not, don't be ashamed of it. Like a lot of people don't, but you have to have an answer to that because if you don't, that means you got some more work to do. That means that's some more people you need to meet. That means it's some more uh, places you need to be where donors are. That means you need to go to a couple more lunches and meet important people like Brother Moore in Brevard County. Like that means you got to do a lot more things if you don't have the answer to that question yet. Because there's a lot of people that come to us and they'll say the right amount. I need to raise a hundred. Then I'll ask them how are you gonna get the first twenty five, uh, and they will say, Well, I'll call friends and family. How much is that? Well, that's five. And, and after that, what you gonna do? Well, I'm just gonna work on it. You, you have to have a solid plan not just the hope to, wish to, want to. You have to have a name next to an amount on an Excel spreadsheet that gets you to that first chunk or else you've answered the question for yourself. 
and and I'll I'll add to this is um, also is um, the importance of our own community donating to uh to their to black candidates, and the reason why I say that is my first max check, and this came off of sure work at, like uh, Brother Shaw said, was from um, uh, the late Representative Elijah McCum uh, Elijah uh, Cummings. He sent me a max check from the hospital. That meant so much to me because I was in the process of figuring out where I was getting that chunk from, how, you know, how I was going to raise the money because, you know, I've never asked anybody for $5 before. And, you know, and I opened up my mailbox and that check was in the mail with a letter from him. You, to a young candidate, seeing that, that is like someone saying, I, I believe in you go do great. Man, the wind was behind me from that moment forward. And so I just, I, we gotta, we gotta do better as a community and, and with, with donating to our, our candidates. We really do um, because it really will mean a lot. Let me ask you, brother, brother, stay rep hearing this, um, just thinking about the brotherhood and uh, maybe you even want to chime in brother DR. If we have these great brothers running for office and you all knowing Omega as we know Omega, uh, do you think it's um, better for some brothers to try to incrementally give, uh, you know, giving bro many brothers uh, plight, or just try to drop that, drop that money? Uh, Brother Dr, I'll let you go ahead and speak first. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Brother State. I'm not sure what you mean by drop that money. However, <laughs> I think <laughs> we've we've gotten we got an awesome op opportunity with Omega and Omega Network for action. So, um, hearing uh, Brother uh, Vice Mayor and his, his plight and 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 ensuring that he can you know, win re-election, it would behoove us to try to push with Omega Network for Action to see if we can get galvanized behind him. To your point, though, when you talk about the drops, I, I, I think each of them will speak to you and say any amount helps. However, if, if you're going to uh, max out, as they've been saying, then we want you to go ahead and max out and give what you're able to give to the respective candidate. Um, I think we do a very good job from um, Omega Network for Action. It's, it's really just uh, going to our... Um, uh, website and then actually putting forth that candidate that you wish to do that. It's a little bit of vetting that takes place behind that. But from there, uh, it's an opportunity then that we can at least get uh, the organization behind that respective candidate. And and I'll just echo the sentiments of, of Brother DR in regards to the initiative um, Omega Network for Action and the things that he's been doing with that. Um, I, I can speak from, you know, the local level in regards to all of, you know, our, our grand counselor, Brother Benjamin Crump. And, and when he was in Tallahassee, the, the, the events that he would have to have fundraisers for not only brothers, but for people that, you know, looked like you and I, you know, you and I that weren't Omegas and, and people that believed in, you know, the things that we spoke of putting the, the money back into our communities. He, he always had fundraisers and, and you know, brothers and, and not just brothers, but people in the communities would come and they would, you know, they would give whatever they could. Um, and like you said, I, I don't think, um, I, I think you want to, you know, as it'll come, you know, whatever a person's willing to give, you know, you, you won't, you won't turn that, in, won't turn that contribution down. So, um, you know, for my answer, like I said, I, I think for Omega, you know, the brothers are willing to give whatever they can when they can. So. Right. Thank you, Brother State Rep. And uh, it takes us to the next question. We're going to get back to it. Um, the late Malcolm X said, the way out of poverty is education. And uh, with Bill Black Daily, we go to step further and say the way out of poverty is economic education. Um, how can uh, we as Omega or you and your roles and entities help trickle down the notion of financial literacy that's just desperately lacking in so many uh, Black communities? And I uh, will start with you, um, Brother Moore. You know, I think that um, uh, my, my folks around here sometimes, Brother Drake, get tired of hearing me uh, uh, say it. But at the end of the day, you know, I think it boils down to, to three colors is what I tell my folks, black, white, and green, black print, white paper, green dollars. And it's not just the black and white the green, unfortunately, we can like it or not, 
uh, becomes such a critical component. We've talked about it in terms of, of, of politics tonight, uh, but but in watching what, what you've been able to do with your campaigns, I think uh, many people around the state know when you set out on, on day one and said you were gonna visit 365 different African-American-owned businesses in 365 days, and when you got to 365, it wasn't quite enough, right? And, and part of what you did in that um, was the, the literacy component of making everyone know first that that number of African-American businesses existed across the varying disciplines and platforms. But not only that, you, you helped to highlight their success and maybe even more importantly, where I think you were driving the literacy component is you helped people by asking people, tell me how you started, help me understand where it was difficult and where you went wrong or what really went well. And that helped many, many young entrepreneurs. I think you know here in Brevard County, uh, uh, the folks at uh, 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 Q Seafood and Crab Restaurant, one of your favorites, uh, we're just starting their business when you started that thing six or eight months prior, and they continue to tune in every day and they talk about just how many things that they learn just by you passing on that information of it. So yes, we can talk about the, 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 the basic literacy, but, but particularly helping individuals, aside from politics, who just want to start a business, who want to get involved in business and want to understand in economics and know the, 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 not only the things that they need to know, but what others have gone through as a part of that process, I think is extremely uh, significant. Um, you know, sometimes we look at it as a, as a, as a weird faux pas, uh, to sit down and talk about economics. But the reality of it is economics are real in our daily lives. And I, I, I tell my clients every now and then, particularly my church clients, uh, uh, yes, we may have a revival coming up and yes, we may have a fundraiser coming up. But if you don't believe it's about economics, you tell Florida Power and Light that you're praying and you go going to hope and pray that sooner or later that bill gets paid. And, uh, or, or you go to, to, to Publix and you go to the front counter and you give them something other than cash to, to walk out the door with that apple or that food. It's not going to ultimately work. The economics and, and uh, uh, unfortunately sometimes, or fortunately capitalism uh, uh, can be the crux of, of, of this society and our black and brown folks, uh, whether we like it or not in some circles have to wrap our brain around that and, and continue to build those who have already been successful but also continuing to give back to the least among, you know what I mean, as a part of that process. Vice Mayor Simmons. Well, unregulated capitalism is what's killing us. And that's why we need to have folks in government that are working to make sure that there are checks and balances, no pun intended, uh, within capitalism to make sure those that are less than aren't getting beat up on by the gears of capitalism, right? I don't think anyone on here is against anyone making a billion dollars, but if you're making a billion dollars a year and I'm making $40,000 a year, should I should the $40,000 a year be paying more taxes than the person that's making a billion dollars a year? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> um, but what I would say is economics, right, is uh, trying to satisfy unlimited wants in a world of limited resources, right? That's scarcity, that's what economics, that's the base of economics there. And so what we have to do is, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm you know, extremely wise, but it's just being in the school system, I got to see so much, is that we have to restructure our educational system and how and what we're teaching our kids, right? And the curriculum that has been going on for decades is so, it, it just, it's, it's, it's like a factory, right? And kids aren't factories anymore. They're not machines like how we were, right? Where we were all told, you know, sit up, stand up straight. Yeah. And we did every single thing that we were told. These kids these days, they ask why, you know? <laughs> and so we haven't changed learning to match the way that these kids are being, are developing, right? Because of the advent of technology and phones and having things that they're, you know, they're back and call, you know, they don't have to go to the library and, and go find a book. They can get it up on their phone, right? And so I think we got to have more work-ready programs coming out of high school because a lot of kids um, 
you are finding that they don't necessarily have to go to college to make money. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the generation that one of the largest generations that was told the only way you're going to make money in this country is you go to college. And now we're all saddled with a bunch of student loan debt um, because there just wasn't a, um, a, a work, you know, there wasn't a, a um, the, the workforce wasn't there for us when we got out of college. So I think we got to have work ready programs coming out of high school. I think we got to have internships. A lot of times people think internships in college, we have internships in high school right and helping kids understand money management then and there right and having programs that connect back to the high school it's like all right how much you you know how much was your last check how much money are you saving from it you know having uh, bank accounts you know having schools connected to banks that are going to have student accounts for those internships i mean there's there's different things that we can do um that are going to start getting our kids uh, to learn money management. And I think that's a great foundation to start uh, is, is kind of restructuring how we think about kids are learning and then also getting them connected before they even graduate high school and starting to get their own money and learn how things go. All right, and um, Attorney Shaw, same question. Yeah, I'll be real quick because uh, in the words of that great Negro philosopher, Young Jeezy, he said he was in the trap because Georgia Pie, Georgia Pie won't give a brother lights free, right? So I appreciate that, Brother Moore. Uh, but uh, I, I am much more conspiratorial than even Brother Simmons. And I'm glad he started where he did. The politics of this country is not D versus R. It is about rich people. Uh, and oftentimes politics is the trapping and the diversion from rich people being rich. It doesn't matter the party that's in power. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the speaker of the house is. Rich people will continue to make money in this country because that's the name of the game. And so while, while I, I don't wanna diminish financial literacy, I wanna make sure we understand that um, corporate abuse and what goes on with regard to corporate power in this country is the name of the game. Uh, and we should all be upset at the person that's holding the strings in this country uh, that holds the strings of all, at all of us. And that is kind of the corporate class. And that's what this country is geared towards. And oftentimes the, the social upheaval and the critical race theory and the don't say gay and the black versus white and I'm mad at you and you mad at me. Oftentimes that is just a diversion for the fact that uh, rich people have made more money during the pandemic than at any time in the history of this country. Now, uh, if you believe that those two things are unrelated, then I have a bridge uh, that I would like to sell you over the ocean in Kansas. The, that is what we need to uh, understand. And it doesn't matter what party controls what. Rich people at the top make money regardless. They make money during war. They make money during a pandemic. They make money during uh, a George Floyd trial. They make money during any January 6th insurrection. They make money no matter what. And oftentimes I just think we need to peek behind the curtain sometimes and, and understand that a lot of us have more in common when it comes, to, to, uh, when it comes time to fight who's really pulling the strings um, than if we just yell and scream at each other about what we don't like uh, and what we mad about each other at. And um, Brother State Rep, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I, I'll speak to it. Um, you know. Coming from um, my my seat and my perspective, you know, a lot of the programs that we have, you know, whether it's um, social action programs or fatherhood and mentoring program, teaching the youth how to, to do investing. I, I saw a comment from um, one of the um, guests, you know, Tony Green said something in regards to long term investing is the key, um, you know. I would love to see us as a fraternity um, at our district meetings, at our state workshops, um, even, you know, at our conclaves do workshops that that teach, you know, our brothers, um, you know, you know, these these relevant issues, um, how to do financial investing, um, different things to to bring that wealth into our community. So, you know, I, I, I really want to make a push to to see those type of things. And, and teach our undergraduate brothers those type things when they're coming into the fraternity, um, you know, so if we teach, you know, them, they teach, uh, you know, the next person. So that, that's where I think we begin within the fraternity, so. All right, thank you, Brother State Rep. And I don't know if Brother DR wanted to chime in, but I, I do want to tell you this. I've um, scavenged all fraternity and sororities websites. The only fraternity, that, the only organization that has a commitment to supporting black businesses is that it was one of their national programs on their site 
is Phi Beta Sigma. And they got a program that goes back to the 40s. Some Sigmas right now may not know about it. It's called the Support a Negro Business Movement. And because with the word Negro is there, we know it was a long time ago. But it's just something that I want to pitch eventually to the whole NPHC. We should be pushing that notion of supporting Black businesses. And I see what you're doing in the state of Florida with that, uh, Brother Tolston. And um, that's going to bring us up to our last question. And um, I mean, I think this is awesome. We're getting a lot of views on um, online. And um, last question is, um, is there a viable opportunity for Blacks to receive reparations at any level? So I see, you see what's happening out there in California. Um, and if not, what's the next, next best course of focus for us? And uh, we'll start with you, Vice Mayor Simmons. Uh, I would say in a city like Coral Springs, absolutely not. Um, that's just me being honest. Um, honestly, I think that's something that needs to come from the, uh, I would say the federal level. Um, but similar to what Brother Shaw said earlier, as far as like there's money, um, when you get into this field, there is money. There literally, there is money. Um, I know that I wanted to try out a uh, universal basic income program. It's not reparations, but universal basic income program, which I know would help black and brown folks out. Um, and But we just shoestring budget, at least at the city level, we couldn't get it done. Uh, but as far as reparation goes, I mean, I think, I think it's got to come from the federal level. We're already $1.7 trillion in debt. What's another three? So, I mean, go ahead and get it to us. Let us put that money back in the economy. The black dollar has always been strong. Um, we have we have continuously held up this country's economy. Uh, and uh, anytime, anytime people start saying, oh, the economy is booming, it's because of black folks. So go ahead, get out, give us that money uh, and uh, let us uh, put it to work. All right. Um, we'll go to you, Attorney Shaw. This is the first time I might disagree with Brother Simmons. I, I do think it's viable at a federal level, but it won't be money. It would be uh, it could be tax breaks. It could be scholarships to HBCUs. It could be, I could see something like that, but I don't see a check. Y'all ain't getting a pandemic check. Uh, and <laughs> you're not getting a, a reparation check, but I could certainly see some sort of tax home ownership credit, or I, I could see something like that being viable. Um, because listen, Black people elected Joe Biden to the presidency um, directly. And so I, I could see that uh, if we pushed it hard enough that that could be done, but it wouldn't be a cash, I don't think it could be a cash payment. And so I don't think we ought to be maybe suggesting that. I think we got to let people know that this would be some kind of indirect payment, but I think it's viable on a federal level. All right, um, Attorney Moore. Yeah, you know, in, in short, I think both, both brothers are correct. I think it certainly could be done on a federal level. Think that it, it as, as Brother Shaw said, could take other forms. Um, the one point that I would add is simply this, um, until that time, there is a significant amount of economic empowerment that could be taking place while we wait. And like the old folks used to say, you know, it says, wait on the Lord, you got to do some working while you wait, right? And so it may take some time to come. And so we shouldn't be using the waiting on Martin philosophy that maybe one day, you know, we'll get it. We should continue to use the political authority we have to push. But in the meantime, uh, uh, just what uh, this state organization has put together today to talk about uh, uh, economic empowerment and not just, as you said earlier, economic literacy, but the economic realities while we wait on those things to come through, I think is just as important as the day, one day when they may arrive. Right. And so it's an interesting thing, right? We see in California that they're talking about through the state legislature giving uh, reparations to those who are descendants um, of brothers and sisters who were in chattel slavery. And I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten time to research. I see that out there. You know, I've heard of um, even now there's talks of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a hundred years after um, the burning down of Black Wall Street and bombing of it, uh, they're trying to look to see an opportunity to give reparations to some of those descendants. And um, I mean, we also see with the um, the violence going over between Russia and Ukraine, that at the federal level, there have been billions of dollars immediately, immediately dispersed. I'm talking about with whew, no, no argument, just out the door. 
So, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying there's, they find money when it's time to find money. Uh, we'll go to you, uh, Brother State Rep, with the same question. Again, uh, I think Brother uh, Shaw hit it on the head. Um, it, there could possibly be something at the federal level, but um, in regards to a check, you know, I, I won't hold my breath for that, you know. Uh, you know, some kind of loan forgiveness, you know, scholarship dollars or, or, or even, you know, some kind of real estate investment would be um, better than nothing. But um, like I said, I, I, I just don't see a, a check being written uh, anytime soon. <laughs> I got you. I got you. But I don't get me right wrong. I didn't I didn't say it was going to happen. I just said that's where I think it was the best way for it to happen. I, I don't I, I'll be quite honest with you at the federal level. I don't think that I don't. I don't even think we're going to get what uh, uh, Brother Shaw was saying. I just don't think because we we have to be able to come together entirely across this country to move this forward. And unfortunately, we get distracted quite a bit. I, I would agree with that, yes. So so while you said that, this, this is where we're coming together. It starts right here with the Florida State Wide Organization. Oh, it matriculates out to the 7th District with the DR. Reginald Harris of YE with that new stadium they built at Jackson State University. Then it perpetuates the mighty 7D who's pushed brothers into office, setting the tone for the frat. Then it then it comes over the whole frat. So we're we're putting it, you know, it's like this is where we have to start it. Um, and I know Brother Shaw has pushed this for, for now three years to say we have to have a cues on the hill to get these minds together. And we just see the great things. If y'all see me looking down, I've been taking notes on this. Uh, when this is all over, we're going to have a report submitted to the state rep and, and subsequently to the DR to let us know what we learned from here and the actionable items from it. And uh, um, so with that, uh, we'll go to closing remarks and we'll just get one minute closing remarks from all our panelists. And uh, we'll start with you, uh, Brother Attorney Shaw. Hey, I, I mean, this was great. Uh, I appreciate this and, and you all could sense a lot of frustration because that's just where this country is. That's politically where we are. And so I appreciate these were great topics, particularly you could tell the passion I had for the fundraising one because that's important for our people to understand that. And so Brother Simmons, I, I intend to give to you incrementally since you seem to be okay with that. And so I will give to you a little, a little bit at a time just to make sure you keep calling me brother. Uh, but I also want to say thank you. When I ran for Attorney General, I want to tell you the brothers were so good to me across this state. Uh, they were the backbone of my campaign. I want to tell you that no matter where I went in this state, the brothers were amazing to me. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, that is a time where uh, we did what we're trying to do right here. The brothers came together and I don't care if it was money. I don't care if it was a crust in a corner. I don't care what it was. The brothers were very good. And I just want to tell you, thank you. Uh, and we just need to do more of that. And I know we will. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, Brother Simmons. Uh, I just want to say that I could not have done any of any of this political stuff without me being a member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, all of the things that I did um, and have done, you know, since that time geared me and got me ready for this. Anytime it got hard, I leaned on the shield. Anytime it got difficult, I leaned on my knowledge and everything and my experiences to push forward through this. Um, any day it was hard. It was, it was like I I made it, right? And I was like, yeah, I made it. Let's go. Um, and I'll say that um, I will say that without brother Bobby Henry, the owner of the West Side is at Broward County, I would not be here as an elected official. It was him that sent out my resume to a bunch of people saying this young brother wants to get involved. And then I had somebody call me back and I worked on a campaign and the rest was history. Um, and so I, I just want to say to all the brothers that's listening, you don't necessarily have to be elected but you can be in different positions of power within the political arena. There is a brother named Clarence Anthony. He is the CEO of the National League of Cities. He is responsible. This brother is responsible for the first time in this country's history, federal dollars on such a large scale, the American Rescue Plan Act got distributed directly to cities. Usually federal dollars have to go through the state and then filter down to the cities. In a state like Florida, it would have been very difficult for us to see those funds. But because of their advocacy, uh, Clarence Anthony and the National League of Cities, um, their advocacy, they were able to get those funds distributed directly to cities, first time in history. And many people have been putting them to good use throughout um, the country. 
Uh, and so I just want brothers to know that it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be elected. It'd be great to be on the side. It ain't for everybody, all right? Everything ain't for everybody. But there are different methods and different um, areas in the political arena that you can be involved in. And the National League of Cities is a nonpartisan organization. So they're not working on a lot of like the social justice issues, but more of the eco true economic city building issues. Get on. We'll go to uh, we'll go to brother Moore. Uh, again, brother Drake, uh, uh, appreciate you tonight uh, uh, as the moderator um, uh, for the state representative Tolson. You you uh, uh, certainly have, have uh, taken this Florida statewide organization to a different level with the dialogue. I think that has taken place between the brothers uh, over these three nights. Uh, uh, had the pleasure of participating uh, uh, tonight, but had the the pleasure to listen in. Uh, uh, on night one and two. And, and Brother Drake, as you said a minute ago, uh, there was so much information that you wanted to have your phone or a pen and a piece of paper to not only take down the things that you learned, but most importantly, I think you walked away from each night where there was a discussion about a plan of action. What are we going to do differently? And certainly I think the, 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 the cues on the hill when we have the opportunity post COVID to get back together and collectively gather in Tallahassee will continue to be important. But I think interestingly enough, driven by this, this uh, uh, Zoom-based dialogue, it has created an opportunity for us to talk, right? And just to really discuss these, these issues that are of, of uber importance uh, uh, to all of us, politics and economics and community and the like. And I think these ongoing discussions, hopefully it will drive all of us, but if it only drives a handful of us, to do something differently tomorrow than we did today or than we did yesterday, it's going to certainly uh, be more than worth it. And so uh, I certainly say appreciate uh, this, this opportunity to, particip to participate uh, to the DR. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight uh, and, and the opportunity to, to see what is going on in this great state. And uh, we hope and continue uh, that each and every person will make a, a, a more intense commitment to whatever your little piece of the pie may be, um, that together we can make a substantial difference uh, on this behalf. Uh, I say it again to, to each of you, thank you. And uh, if there's any way that we can help, we'll be more than happy to do so. All right, and I'm um, gonna come back to Brother Toast. Let me uh, get some acknowledgements real quick. I wanna acknowledge Graham Bosslis, uh, Dorsey Miller, who um, actually first talked to us about this about four years ago. Um, immediate past state rep, M. Kevin Woodall, who, um, who actually is responsible for the initial architecting of the agenda. And um, also the state rep for pushing me to push this forward, Brother Tolston, thank you. Uh, Brother J. Randy Johnson, our voter registration, education, and mobilization chairman. Uh, Brother Johnson is going to work with me as we work to formulate this agenda. As I see uh, Brother Green is putting there, we need some actionable steps. And I think our actual steps forward are one, if I heard, one, make sure everybody's registered to vote and your information is updated, verify it's updated. And uh, then two, from there, uh, we're, we're taking notes on these issues that we need to lobby for as a block of educated black men. And this, but that's why there's a need for us to re recap in the fall and then go to, perhaps go to Tallahassee in the fall then. Because if we only go in the spring, we're going in the ceremonial sense. We want to go where we make that impact in the fall, and then we're putting that exclamation mark on it, that lightning bolt on it in the spring. And I'm going to go for um, remarks to closing remarks from, um, I want to go to the DR and then the final remarks to State Representative Tostin. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Drake. This has been a, an awesome event. Um, I couldn't, couldn't uh, re, re advocate more for the holistic portion of, of just economic empowerment. I think each night has been tremendous. I've, I've had the opportunity to listen in as well. Um, but from coming from community, uh, speaking on uh, the economic empowerment and, and the political action or legislative side of it. Uh, we can do more uh, as it relates to Omega. I think I saw a couple of those things where they're talking about action items. Hopefully we can get some action items from here. We've already set some things in motion um, as it relates to the district. Um, we have 
several places there where they're starting even democracy centers in, in the respective communities uh, there so they can try to effectuate change there for the black and brown folks who look like us, making a difference in the lives of, of black people. And so um, to, your, to your ending point where you talked so much about um, the reparations and you talked about the, the monies and possibly getting those. To me, we have not because we ask not. If, if there's an opportunity uh, where we can leverage uh, something like they've done in California, something like they've done in Oklahoma, then by all means, we need to try that first uh, from a reparation standpoint and then try to expand it globally uh, where possibly we can get that on a federal level. Uh, but by all means, I am behind it. Uh, I certainly know uh, that our state representative there as well, uh, Brother Tosin, is behind it. And any way that we can do uh, from Omega's platform, we want to try to move uh, everything that you have and you've been speaking forward. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Brother Harris. Also, let me give some acknowledgments to uh, Brother Mike Bowie, who was a moderator all the good undergraduate brothers who read the bios in a wonderful manner. And I mean, those brothers didn't stutter. I mean, hey, you can tell the educational process was live. Uh, they did wonderful. Uh, we've had so many excellent brothers on. Uh, before we bring up the state rep, um, I wanna acknowledge brother, uh, brother Curtis Rush. Brother Rush has been our technology chair. And brother Rush, if you could, would you bring up uh, the elected officials uh, list that we have put together? So in conjunction with uh, our director of PR, Brother Bowie, as well as uh, Brother Randy Johnson, the V-Room chair, uh, we've put together the brothers that we've uh, been made aware of who are in elected office throughout the state of Florida. And uh, this is a list that uh, I, I anticipate will continue to grow. Uh, these are the ones we know of. I have a feeling there may be more out there, but these are the brothers uh, serving. You know, if you look at it, this list, this is over 20 brothers. It's probably about 24 brothers right now. And uh, what's not on there, we don't have judges on there yet. And um, we'll work to get more brothers on here so we can share it so brothers can see. And I also have the opportunity to connect and continue to grow and leverage. Um, I mean, you just heard about how these brothers have all been in contact with one another. And uh, somewhere, we, we got some great pictures, Vice Mayor and um, Attorney Shaw from uh, one of those leadership blues about four or five years ago. But uh, we, you know, we need to be able to connect and help each other and leverage the intellect that we have. Um, and we can stop sharing. And now we'll go to the 24th elected state representative of the Florida Statewide Organization, Helen from Chi Omega, Darren Tolstoy. Thank you again, my, my energetic brother, Brother Drake. Um, again, I can't thank you enough and your committee for your hard work and, and, and putting this event together. We talked about it a number of years ago um, and for you know, one thing or another, you know, we, we haven't been able to get it together until, until this week right here. And I look forward to you know, the continued success on trying to make this happen, not only in the fall, but in the spring again. Um, I know you said you'll, you've been taking a number of notes. Um, I've been chiming in and kind of looking at the chat as well. And uh, we're going to do our best to make sure that a lot of the things that were mentioned tonight are put into action. Um, we have a district representative that has been supportive of me and um, my administration has been supportive of um, the, the statewide organizations, not only here in Florida, Georgia, Alabama and Mississippi um, throughout his tenure. Um, and we can't thank him enough for the support that he's provided uh, to us. Um, for our brothers that have served on this panel this evening and, and throughout the, the rest of this week, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come and, and speak to us and, and talk to us about, you know, I, I know I used the word frustration earlier, but, you know, frustration is nothing more than passion. You, you all are passionate about, you know, the jobs that you have and, and the things that you want to see, um, you know, succeed in our community. So. Again, you know, whatever we can do um, as a state organization, as a district to help you, um, you know, on your paths, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, for my brothers you know, that have chimed in this evening, um, again, thank you. Um, as always, we, we, we look forward to more programs like this um, in the future. Um, so look forward to this and, and continued success of, you know, everyone involved with this and, and the other events that we have going on throughout the year. Brother Drake, uh, thank you. That's a wrap.
All right.